All right. Good morning, everyone. Thanks. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Uh, welcome to the Sea Explorers podcast, episode one. We have myself, Daniel Chung, I'm the VP of Enterprise Partnerships with Contact Point 360. A uh, bit of an AI nerd, a lot of an AI nerd, actually. A uh, bit of a tech geek as well. I'm very passionate about Formula One, all things mechanical, watches, planes, cars, you name it. Um, and we also have Jasper Aldri Nastor uh, joining us from the Philippines. Jasper, if you want to just maybe give ourselves a quick introduction. Yeah, yeah. Hello to all of our uh, listeners. Uh, again, uh, episode one, really excited. So team Jasper and Nastar here. Uh, I've been in the BPO space for almost a decade now. Currently a lead architect for AI-driven CX solutions here at Contact Point 360. So really always in the landscape and in the market for uh, looking over, right? New solutions, new innovations that actually elevates customer service within the contact center industry. And almost similar with Daniel, right? Uh, Formula One nerd. I'm also a geek when it comes to consumer uh, technology, gaming, and also an avid toy collector. Awesome. Thanks, Jasper. And really, C Explorers, the podcast, what we aim to do and talk about and discuss is really just open up ideas to really help us learn, um, help others that are listening also learn about potential upsides because we know there's massive upsides to AI, customer service, the impacts that it can have uh, just on the world itself, and also the potential downsides and how we can really make sure that as you know, the world progresses on this AI journey that we're also thinking about the potential risks, how we mitigate and control it, and how we can pump, potentially pump the brakes when needed. Uh, so we're really looking forward to kind of the first two topics that we'll really be talking about is exactly that, um, uh, really around some of the deep dives into some of the ethical concerns with artificial intelligence. And on a more positive note, we're also going to talk about sentiment analysis, which Jasper, I know you're a bit of an expert on in terms of how AI is being used right now within you know the retail, within businesses to really help their customers. Because at the end of the day, I think the one common thing between our listeners, myself, you, is really that we're all consumers of one way or another. And I think it's important that as AI becomes more integrated into those customer experiences, is um, that we understand the potential pitfalls even as the buyers, uh, because again, there's a lot of scams and social engineering that AI can also do very effectively. And it's really important that we continue to kind of keep ourselves on the forefront of educating ourselves about those risks to avoid us you know, getting burned uh, in the future. Yeah. So uh, one of the basic ones that we usually start off with uh, uh, when it comes to uh, AI sentiment analysis, right, is to be able to correlate uh, negative, positive and even neutral sentiment towards some of the products that you're offering. Right. And from a call center standpoint, your call drivers. Right. So. Uh, very uh, unusual where you get the type of data from a survey standpoint where customers would really express in a very refined categorization, you know, what exactly they actually had problems with. Usually it, it refers to agent, it, it refers to a lot of things, right? But when it comes to NLP, you're going to be able to easily segregate each and every one of those, right? Whether or not the negative sentiment was towards a specific process or a specific product or even like the overall call driver, right? And after you kind of get your hands dirty around that and understand, you know, what drives uh, positive, negative or neutral sentiment, you know, from the call types that you're receiving, you can now also, you know, add in a lot of uh, types of analysis into the mix, right? Whether or not uh, you want to understand if the, 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 the customer went in angry, right? And whether or not the agent was able to kind of turn around the whole uh, experience. Because from these queries that I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of technical stuff that you can do within it, right? You're not just going to be capturing like the overall sentiment, but there's some technical nuances that where you can like put capture first 30 seconds, capture last 30 seconds, right? Gives you a lot of flexibility to be able to understand, you know, what part of the call you want to be able to capture uh, these sentiments on, right? And just be able to correlate it back, right? To understand if an agent was able to turn around the experience, like what did that agent do? What did agent A did with what agent B did, right? As to why he or she was not able to kind of not turn around the experience. And at the same time, uh, there's also a lot of data that you can actually combine, not just from an NLP standpoint, uh, but with the telephony and the recording system, Daniel, there's a lot of metadata that you can add into the mix. Say, for example, you know, hold time, uh, 
customer talk time, silence time. I mean, there's just a lot of ways that you can play around with the data. Now, having said that, and I, I just want to make sure that I'm not kind of skipping forward here, Daniel, there's also going to be some issues when it comes to analysis paralysis. And, you know, I, for one, am definitely uh, a victim of that because when you're just sitting down looking at all these data points, you kind of have to take a step back. Right. And understand what, what, what do I want to do with this? Right. Because there's a lot of ways now. There's a lot of data points that you can connect with each other and be able to put the out, uh, generate the outcome that you want so that you can, you know, put together an action plan uh, of some sort. So, yeah. For sure. And I think companies, even like KFC, have really started to use the data captured and the correlations between where a negative sentiment may be with a certain service experience or delivery experience, whatever the case might be. And if you kind of look at KFC's marketing strategy, right, they've really taken a lot of the sentiments, the data that they gather from different channels of marketing. And what they've done is really built localized campaigns to be relevant in their local markets, obviously. See, everyone does that. But at the same time, they're also using and play, poking fun at some of the jokes that have been made, right? And just really being able to make light of certain things that where they're not taking themselves too seriously. And that really becomes, you know, part of their strategy to become like a meme, right? If they can get their advertisement or a billboard um, to be a meme, it's going to have tremendous reach, right? And I think the one one that I saw on a billboard was it was their it's finger licking good, but they had the finger and the licking blurred out. Right. And just by doing something so small like that, right, it makes people think it kind of is a bit disruptive in the, in their approach. And they're really putting themselves in more of a digital Gen Z type of marketing approach to really connect with, you know, the new generation of customers that are really coming to that marketplace. And I think that's why AI is really important in terms of understanding those sentiments, drawing correlations in terms of where we can improve our marketing or service, whatever the case might be. Um, but like you said, while also protecting the customers and their data as well, right? I think that's really part two of what we're going to be discussing today. Um, in terms of some of the different products out there, um, like how does a company or an individual or someone that's, you know, got a company and they see the benefits of AI scaling their business very quickly without a lot of, you know, additional resources that need to bring on. What are some of the use cases that you've seen or even some of our clients have come in with um, that are really like, if I was to come in and say, Jasper, Daniel, I don't know anything about, you know, the sentiment analysis or NLP stuff you're talking about, but it does sound cool where AI could analyze and give me a lot of those insights. What does that journey look like for someone entering that space? Actually, uh, right now, you know, as we progress with this AI landscape, uh, everyone has started to put together, right, uh, the, the, their guideline, right? So back then, I remember uh, when I started, you know, as an early AI adopter, there was a lot of confusion on where you want to start. Right. And right now, uh, joining a lot of webinars and fireside chats, I've seen some uh, sort of uh, pattern on how people are actually utilizing uh, AI sentiment analysis. So first things first, right, uh, before you kind of dive into AI sentiment analysis, you want to be able to understand, right, like, where does AI sentiment analysis stand when it comes to the landscape of AI technologies that you have out there, right? And I'm going to like break this down into three things, right? So when you're in the market with uh, AI in general, right, there's three things that you need to look out for, right? So there's going to be, I would say, like contact center of the future, agents of the future, and reportings of the future, right? So we're, we're uh, owning and coining those terms, thing. <laughs> so contact center of the future right these are going to be uh the ai tools uh that's going to be more customer facing your chat bots your voice ais anything that interacts with your customer and then next would be agent of the future right so these are going to be like your rtaa real-time agent analysis you know auto summary all the things that agent uses to make their lives easier right as our frontline and for speech analytics this is going to be essentially reporting of the future you just want to be able to have our listeners uh uh, like kind of get grasp on that because speech analytics NLP, it's post facto, right? So everything is already done. So you're essentially just checking and seeing, you know, uh, what transpired, what can you do better? What, what are, what are the pain points that you have not seen before with the old, uh, 
type of reporting that you may have for whatever reason or whatever type of survey uh, solution you have, right? So that's the first thing, right? You need to understand that speech analytics, NLP, AI sentiment analysis is post facto, right? And it's going to be used for you to be able to understand historical data. Right. So that's the first one. Right. And now now that you kind of understand that NLP is post facto. Right. You want to be able to now then categorize right from an AI sentiment analysis standpoint. What part do you want to start with? Right. Because there's a lot of use cases that you can go through this, whether or not you want to look for uh, product sentiment. Right customer sentiment or even just overall sentiment right so usually we'd like to be able to start off with with just overall sentiment right be able to understand how much portion of your calls are getting positive negative neutral and from there you want to be able to now then drill down you know to specifically to the products that you're offering right so you want to understand that okay from 50 percent of the overall uh negative sentiment like what what's the most impacting Right. So that's kind of, Daniel, I think going to be the, the, the first few steps that you have to go through. Right. And additionally, uh, there's also going to be some uh, concerns when it comes to AI sentiment analysis, because and I'm just talking by personal experience. Right. Uh, usually uh, people would compare like how accurate is it? Like, and, Am I allowed to talk about that or is it something that's going to be on the next <laughs> topic? Mm -hmm. Daniel? Can I just go on? <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. So when it comes to AI sentiment analysis, also to, to, to all of our listeners, right? Uh, I, I think it's important for everyone to understand that this is not going to be anything similar to surveys, right? Because for surveys, customers are uh, essentially uh, answering that overall, right? But for sentiment analysis, AI sentiment analysis, it's actually what transpired just with that. And just so everyone's call. clear, right? Like a positive sentiment could be like, hey, I want to look at potentially, you know, adding some additional services to my mobile plan, right? Or a negative could be, hey, I had some billing issues. I'm thinking of canceling. And then the, the essentially the AI or NLP can kind of pick up on certain verbiage, how they're formed together in terms of categorizing as a positive and negative. And from what I understand, again, for our listeners that may not know this, right? But when it comes to like NLP sentiment analysis and any type of machine learning really is it needs repetition to learn. Right. I know yeah. with even some of the um, self-driving cameras, right, for it to recognize the difference between a reflection, a traffic light, a blinking traffic light and a turn signal can be really difficult. Right. And it takes millions and millions of different types of images that it has to analyze every single month so it can understand, OK, based on the positioning of where I am as a camera, where this potentially is, it could be a car, it could be an SUV and God forbid it's an electric car. So it's got really weird placement of that's brake lights. Um, but I think that learning is really important, right? And I think that's kind of what you were getting to, right? With NLP, it's exactly. you need to collect that to make it accurate. Exactly. Right on. Got it. So I know that this has kind of always been an elephant in the room. Um, and I've heard it a lot at different conferences and, and meetings where people are, you know, hesitant about AI. They don't. And I think part and parcel of that is because AI is so new, and with ChatGPT, you know, really blowing up way faster um, than anyone could have imagined, it's we're trying to play the game of catch up with governing it yeah. now. They've and so open a Pandora's box, right? We've opened Open Pandora's <laughs> box. Yeah. And what we've done is this genie that's come out of this box at the same time. It's we see all these wonderful things, right? It's like, oh my gosh, this thing can summarize a web page for me. So <laughs> I don't need to spend the next two hours reading this before I go into my meeting. Or it can help me, you know, summarize what I've written is 200 words so I can fit it all into my PowerPoint slide, whatever the case might be, wh whoever or however people are using it. But with kind of having this magical genie at your disposal, it also brings that back that same dilemma is be careful what you wish for because you don't know how that wish is going to come true sometimes. And I think that's really the concern with AI is as we have more and more ambitious goals of what we want generative AI and predictive AI to be able to do is we also have a humongous risk here where the AI is going to say, I can do all of these things. I can probably do it way more efficient cognitively than any human being can. I need more control to be able to do that. And as we give that more control, it's where do we pump the brakes question comes into play, right? And that becomes a really big concern because it, it can happen really quickly, 
right? And that's why if you look at all those post-apocalyptic movies, the moment the AI comes out, it's not a hundred year downfall of humankind. It's like two years, right? And, and that's the reality of it. I, I was just about to segue that uh, us, you know, we, we, uh, as human beings, we've done probably dozens of movies around this. So for reference, right? <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, Creator just came out, right? <laughs> and, I, and I know Jeffrey Hinton, you know, godfather of AI, U of T um, speaker, and I know he, he brought up a lot of concerns around information security um, because, again, there's a lot of potential. And I think with ChatGPT really exploding, it's shown us that, hey, it can really demonstrate intelligence at this point. Um, to a degree, and it can do certain cognitive things way quicker and way more efficient, right? But my concern, Jasper, and you know this about me, is I always kind of look at also the energy problem that we have, and there is an energy crisis. I don't think anyone's going to beat around the bush with regards to that, and I think it, one of the, the big concerns I personally have with the onset of AI technologies is how much computing power and how much energy yeah. it takes, Right. And I know that, yes, we'll continually make it more efficient, make it better, you know, make it use less energy. But the reality is for if you kind of look into a comparison, chat GPTs, the energy required to power that engine and that behemoth of an AI, it could power 30,000 homes. Right. And yeah. when you look at the human brain and its potential, like we use all of 12 watts of power at most. Right. And I think that's really where we need to understand do we want AI to get to a point of where it can start to imagine, create? Because we're already seeing a lot of that with generative. And when you parse that with predictive AI capabilities and the access to the world's data, you create a very powerful AI. And I think that's where there's a school of thought where people really want to work towards that because there's massive benefits in terms of medical implications, right. curing diseases, a lot of different things. Right. But at the same time, it's, I think the other side of the fence where me and you stand, Jeffrey Hinton and a lot of the others stand as well, is we're not against that, but we need to build the right stepping stones and the right controls to make sure it's safe. Because we've already seen so many people getting scanned, right? Um, generative AI can modify voice now, right? So yeah. it's created a whole a lot of new fear at the same time. And I think... You know, there's no absolutes right or right, right, right or wrong, but it's more so how do we work together with the right folks to really understand the potential implications and mitigating that risk and creating a proper governance structure around that. I know with this whole concept and notion of super intelligence that OpenAI has come out with, they have a governance model and institutions that they're working with. I know UC Berkeley, I think U of T, uh, UBC had even published, you know, certain papers around managing AI risks because of the rapid rapid progression of how quickly it's growing. And like I said, right, we're playing that game of catch up right now. And I think that when we talk about things like sentiment analysis, right, and um, voice to note transcription type services, where you're taking a voice, you know, or an email or a chat description, and you're really summarizing it. Those types of tedious tasks that people have had in the past, those are the best kind of first early stepping stones for us to do that and govern it. And as we get that, we can kind of continue to build on it and say, okay, how can we band together with other institutions that also have a large language model or have a deep learning kind of data set that we can kind of work together, but still keep it protected. And I think with open AI and kind of how this hit the public domain so quickly, it's caused a lot of concern and people saying, okay, now we need to look at backtracking this quickly. Yeah. And, you know, talking about uh, AI risk and mitigation, Daniel, kind of uh, want to, you know, uh, deviate here a, a little bit right uh, on the tech and geek side in me. Uh, not sure if you noticed that how Apple, as you know, one of the first trillion dollar companies actually uh, taking on this AI trade, uh, all of their keynote, they have not mentioned AI once ever since GPT exploded. They're not using the term artificial intelligence, but instead they're using ML because they, they know the implications, they know the risk, right? So they want to be able to kind of segregate their company from all the AI hype train because I, I know for a fact, Apple, you know, they have uh, a lot of resource, right? They know that at some point there's going to be, yeah, that negative implication globally, right? And they want to play it safe, right? I know that they're using AI, but they're, again, they're not using the term AI. They're using a subset of AI, which they call machine learning models. That's for sure. And AI is, it's like me saying I'm in science, right? It's just, it's a categorization of science. And it's, 
and again, it's such a broad topic where things can get diluted. And I know even on this podcast ourselves, we've been using that term like cowboys, <laughs> right? Very loosely. But to your point, right? The best predictive AI that we have is my like predictive text or my emojis that it suggests for me on WhatsApp. Right. And that's really kind of the best use case that we're starting to see. And obviously within our industry, we use a lot of historical and empirical data to help forecast, to help make sure that we're planning the right resources before the peak seasons or the valley seasons come uh, to really be efficient as a business. Right. And to also efficiently serve, you know, and, and, and help your customers. But to your point, right, we need to be very specific with what we're trying to do here, right? So I think with NLP, machine learning, uh, being able to train it, this is really specific and we can control that because that data we can govern and there's InfoSec standards around all of that. But I think it's when it's, we start looking at this AI broad topic and, you know, making it on public domain and really selling it as the best thing since sliced bread, it's we're not thinking about that thing that we talked about before. It's, hey, it's good that you have a magic genie and you want to help this genie create all your, answer all your wishes. But that genie we've seen in a lot of different media <laughs> can go off the rails. Right. And I don't know exactly. if you watch what we do in the shadows. Did you ever see that on Disney? I, I have not actually. You need to watch all four seasons. I think they're having their final season coming out. Um, it's a spinoff from the movie and it is a reality kind of mock show on a bunch of vampires living in today's society and it basically oh. <laughs> follows them it's and it's hilarious right yeah so I, I think when we look at kind of the the risk that we have um and us kind of using it so loosely is we need to have infosec and governance in place for a lot of these technologies and be very specified of what we're trying to build within the science of ai Right? Is it? Are we focusing on machine learning, training, and accuracy? Are we looking at sentiment analysis? Are we looking at how to do a predictive forecast for you know financial projections or whatever that case might be, based on historical value to make people's jobs less tedious? Right? And I think the the, the growing concern that a lot of both sides look at is we don't want Skynet and these you know T one thousand machines coming out. And at the end of the day, we also say, well, we don't want to do the tedious work or the dangerous work. Right. And yeah. machines could do a lot of the mining work, right? Or could do a lot of the construction and kind of the really risky stuff that people put their lives on every day. And on that side, we're saying, yeah, we do want AI for that. And I think the middle ground that we can look at right in the here and now, when I look at, you know, what Jeffrey Hinton is saying, what Sam Altman at Chat GPT and OpenAI is kind of building out, what different universities and institutions are doing, I think the common middle ground is listen, no one's against the idea of, of building up an AI. I think everyone's agreement that it's, we need to not just pump the brakes, but let's just come to like a, a quick pause and say, what are you trying to do, Group A? What are you trying to do, Group yeah. B? And how are we protecting that? Right. And as we get that kind of stamp of training and accuracy in place, those institutions, those groups can come forth and say, I have large language model data. I have deep learning data and machine learning kind of really ironed out here that I think it's you know at a point of accuracy where we can start talking to each other and start looking at other use cases. Right. But I think the foundation of what we're doing within generative AI, uh, with what we're doing within a lot of these types of tools, it's on sand. Right. And the, the best use case and the most protected and most effective use case that we've seen is really a, within our space, I'd say natural language, natural language processing. Right. Exactly. And even right? then, it still takes you guys, you know, six months to nine months to train it, going over millions of moons, different interactions, understanding cultural nuances. Right. And I think that was also a big piece that when we looked at, you know, a lot of this was, okay, we've got this, it's working in Canada or working in the US, but how people talk is really different maybe in Europe or in Asia and what may be perceived as a positive sentiment in North America could really be perceived as a negative sentiment all over the world. Right. And I think that's the stage that when I look at AI as a science overall, we're all still in kind of those earlier journeys. But the problem is, is we understand what those pitfalls could potentially be. And those risks are already happening, right? Because AI is growing so quickly, technology is advancing so quickly. And again, with where we're seeing open AI and some of those implications, like even Cisco Bard, it's being able to do more remedial tasks much more efficiently, right? So even in the here and now, things are progressing at an exponential rate that we've never seen before. And I think that's where a lot of people are nervous um, and a lot of companies see the benefit on it and they need to, you know, obviously drive their bottom line. So there's this rush to kind of get AI to where it needs to be. 
but at the same time, there's a lot of folks that are trying to navigate and say, I don't know left from right here. And like I mentioned before, are we walking upstairs or are we walking downstairs? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Completely right, man. Yeah, it, it, it's it's the, it's a tug of war, right? Nowadays, yeah. right? Between those folks who want to be able to be the first one to innovate, and then the ones that are trying to kind of not really stop them, right? But to, again, kind of guardrail everything, right? And that's one of the things that I'm very excited the most about 2024. I mean, if you ask me, you know, that the things that I'm excited about really is, you know, uh, multimodal uh, generative AI, but at the same time, on top of my list is how lawmakers would actually create a governance around this. Right. I've been seeing a lot of uh, risk, right, especially, you know, from all those folks who's actually uh, using their data as a AI training data. I'm not sure if you uh, seen the article between New York Times and OpenAI, you know, using New York Times articles to train models. Right. So those kinds of stuff. So really excited to be able to see how we can govern everything. But at the same time, you know, for all of our listeners, uh, to Daniel's point earlier, you have to understand that when you're going to be uh, acquiring an AI technology, you need to first understand what's going to be the implications of this. And like what I mentioned earlier, whether or not this is a customer facing AI agent facing AI or something that's going to be used within, you know, a reporting part of your organization. For sure. I, I, one of the benchmarks, I know it's a terrible benchmark. It's <laughs> how good is AI in video games, right? <laughs> and, uh, and for me, man, I think like that's the one thing we haven't talked about today is as both of us are gamers, you know, I do a lot of racing sim. I do a lot of first person shooters and I know in both of those types of categories, AI is <laughs> subpar, right? Um, don't get me started on like Counter Strike, you know, and the AI there, because I've, so, you know, <laughs> I, I want to kick us off on this one if you don't mind. So sure. there's a few things, you know, within uh, the, 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 the within the AI gaming space, right? So the first one would be uh, what they call. Uh, image generation right and when i say image generation right usually there's going to be you know refresh rate 120 hertz 60 hertz 144 hertz so uh, i know nvidia is currently working on uh bumping up those numbers so when i say bumping up those numbers even if you're playing at your screen at 60 fps natively ai can generate additional frames you know bump it up over to 120. so stitching mm -hmm. it it's it's definitely stitching it, and from all the reviews that I've seen, you know, uh, Linus Tech, Dave Two D, everyone is actually mind blown. Man, it, it's quite amazing. But we don't right? even have panels that can handle that. Like, <laughs> that what are, what's the, the, the max <laughs> clock right now? Two hundred twenty four hertz, two forty. <laughs> yeah, two two forty. I think. Yeah. You're gonna you're gonna so, bust out three hundred twenty hertz through generative AI. It's gonna be <laughs> beyond true motion, but. <laughs> So th that that's the first one, and then the, the the second one that I'm also excited about is using generative AI with NPCs. So just imagine, oh man, right, that's right? awesome. <laughs> that's gonna be awesome, especially you know with GTA six, you know, uh, coming in the yeah. pipeline and all the other uh, essentially RPG games, right? That uses NPC. I mean, it's they're not going to be some sort of a robot where you just wait X X X to skip skip skip, but it's going to be more conversational. So I want to be able to uh, see, you know, how how game devs is going to be acquired because we've that sort we've of seen technology. that kind of initial technology being used. Was it No Man's Sky? Uh, yes, it was. Let's Let's see how I, many planets. Yeah, I think it was No Man's Sky. Yeah. It was an overrated game. Yeah. So that game, I think they incorporated an algorithm. Like they basically, if this is me explaining it, um, but it's almost like digital DNA, right? So I think there are 18 quintillion planets now that the system's just co constantly creating. And I don't know if you played the game, but every single planet you go into is completely different. different. And it's just yeah. remarkable at how it comp continues to grow and which is cool and all, but yeah, like do this for NPCs or like make my opponents on like, you know, bot trainings within arenas better because exactly. right. sometimes you're joining an empty server with one other guy on the other team and it's like 19 bots, but <laughs> you guys are stacking like 90 kill stack because the bots AI is so bad. Right. I think gaming implication, gaming has always been, you know, at the forefront of pushing these types of technologies. So that's why I always kind of internalize on the, until AI is like really good on video games, I was like, <laughs> I don't really see it kind of advancing past. And I'm, it's, it's, I think I'm really excited to see what kind of integrations they can potentially do on the GTA 6 yeah. front. Exactly. Exactly. Because that's I think, slated you know, for what, 2026? Tw yeah, 2026. So and 2028, realistically. Yeah, I was just about to say that. <laughs> 2026, 2028, realistically. Rockstar, don't sue us. We love you. Uh, you make the best games, but yeah. 
I love GTA. Yeah, Rockstar, yeah. Red Dead Redemption. Oh, love yeah. it, man. <laughs> yeah, game of the century for sure. Nice. Yeah. Did you hear? Uh, have you been following Haas? I know last time we spoke on uh, Gunther Steiner exiting, and now his kind of chief engineer is taking over. And have you seen the comments that he's been making? <laughs> yeah. I, it, it's hilarious, man. And with uh, Drive to Survive coming out this February, oh, man, he's, <laughs> he's this new guy's gonna be Gunther Part Two because <laughs> he's like, we should just sell the team. This car's not even gonna be a tenth place car. I don't even know why we're doing this. <laughs> like, oh, it's gonna be it's gonna be a good season. This one and the next season is gonna be amazing. I know, I know. I mean, ever since that whole uh, redesign for uh, Aero and everything. Like Formula One has just been really excited. Uh, you know, yeah. it's been exci- I, I exciting. I think Max is still gonna, you know, be like two tenths, you know, three tenths faster. Because if you look at how his car is tuned, like and Alex like, Albon explained this amazing. He's like, imagine you're a gamer and your sensitivity on your mouse is set to like super high, and he's like, and let's say you're working on a 15 inch laptop. So he's like, you're not gonna be able to follow that cursor because any movement is gonna shift it so high. So he's like, when I was Max's like teammate. He's like, that car was so sharp that the tiniest inputs, it would turn. And he was like, for me, it felt like the car was out of control. But he's like, that's just how precise Max was. So he's like, it's really hard as a teammate. It's not that the car's built around Max. It's just that I need it sharper. I need it sharper so I can go faster. And he was that much quicker. Yeah. So he's like, it's hard for a teammate like Perez to even keep up with him because that car's so sharp. And he's like, and as good as Lewis is, he's like, that car's no, no, no near as sharp as Max's car, right? And, and again, if you look at how much race time Max gets, like the guy lives on his simulator. So, cause he loves to drive. And that's where I think I would like to see Max like challenge, you know, Schumacher and Hamilton's seven titles. I don't think it'll happen. Yes, Max has a lot of life left in this F1 career, but the kid loves driving and he wants to try rally. He wants to take a stab at Le Mans. There's yeah, a lot of ambition that, that he yeah. has, right? And and he's been training for like Le Mans through the sim, right? And, it, and right now he's not beating all the sim guys. And that's where he's like, that's why I love sim racing. He's like, because these guys out there from God knows where are taking lines on the track that I would never take in my life. And he's like, and they're beating me. So... It's pretty cool how how the, I think sim racing has gotten so real too, and again, that's where AI needs to get better. <laughs> yeah, because it's yeah, it's just not there yet. So I- I- imagine you know a, a bot that actually replicates not well not really replicates but kind of understands your gaming style, right? So say for example Tekken Eight, right? So uh, the, the the bot would kind of review your historical fights, right, and be able to anticipate your next move, so that it's just going to be more challenging. I mean, I think similar to predictive AI, right? That's just going to be uh, uh, would take gaming to the next level, man. That that's going to be amazing. Yeah, you, you'd literally make super villains in your video games <laughs> <laughs> that you'd never be able to beat. <laughs> But that would be cool to say, right? I think it would be so immersive. And I, and I know, you know, with Jeff Hinton, one of the things he said as well was it's the ability and with quantum computing coming out and kind of advances there, the speed and amount of data that everything can process is going to be unheard of. And I think that's really where it's just all of this stuff, like even because if we look at uh, Apple's vision, Right, it's so Vision spot Pro, on yeah. in the accuracy of how you can navigate things just with a tiny flicker of your eye, and that's kind of where AI is going to eventually be going. And that's where Hinton's thinking. You know, in the thirties, twenty thirties, he's like, we might be at a point where we can somehow plug a part of us into the cloud and do a data upload. Right, and exactly. he's like, that's really cool, but really risky at the same time because we can process information so quickly. And I always make the joke like AI. Is, I don't think AI is going to take over us, but I think you know, for us to be potential cyborgs or human kind of kind of evolve there. I think what's already in the works, right? If you look at prosthetics and the technology that that's had, right? The integration of Bluetooth to certain brain waves now within those prosthetics and then kind of advancing that to another level in terms of nanotechnology, right? All of this is really working to get us to a point where we'll be like a real life working Borg from Star Trek, right? Where we're, we can connect to the hive. We can still hopefully be human and individual. Um, and then a lot of the menial tasks, you know, will just be taken care of by machine. And a lot of the dangerous tasks should be taken care of by machine. And uh, I, I saw this headline uh, from uh, an article of uh, an MIT study. Uh, they're saying that AI will probably not take your job, but don't get too comfy. Right. And, and it's yeah. true. 
right? It's definitely true. So while it's okay to play it safe within the AI landscape right now, right? Well, you can have your apprehension and say that, no, it's still not accurate. No, it's still not good. You have to understand that other players who want to be able to get first dibs, they're, they're learning, right? They're, they're, they're building process. They're able to actually get a lot of case studies in and also a lot of learnings from the failures, right? So th that gives them an edge, right? I think also from a context center standpoint when they can just easily stand in front of an RFP process and say that, yeah, we have experience with that, similar to what we're doing, you know, uh, with Contact Point 360. Uh, we can stand in front of a client and say that, yeah, we, we have experience with this. We have experience with this. So I think for all of our listeners, right, it's okay to be cautious, but at the same time, you have to, I, I guess I just want to, again, reiterate from the, the article from MIT, right? AI will probably not take your job, but don't get too yeah. comfy. And I think, you know, I've, I've talked to some of our partners as well. And one of the initial concerns back in like 2020 when, or 2021, when ChatGPT really started getting used a lot more, and was ChatGPT2, I think back then, was, oh, AI is going to replace like everyone's jobs. And uh, personally, I think that's a really defeatist type of loser <laughs> mindset uh, because I'm sure people said the same thing when the first personal computer came out, yeah. right? And I was talking with my wife yesterday. I was like, I can't imagine a, wor a world before email or before Excel or any of these tools that we use on our day to day that comes second nature. Right. I'm like, imagine how chill things would be Jasper. If it was, you know, the seventies and I had to mail you every time I wanted to talk to you overseas and then wait for you to reply. <laughs> right. And, but if we look at that, when the computer came out, people were probably worried about, I'm going to lose my job sending mail, right? I'm going to lose my mailroom job or I'm going to lose my typing and type typography job. Cause I can't do data entry anymore. And yeah, you should be, right? But at the same time, look what computers did. It opened up an entire, probably the most lucrative industry on the planet, yeah. right? And it's really created this massive shift. And I think AI, if we still focus on the optimistic side of things and say, hey, this could also create thousands upon millions of jobs in the next 10, 20, 30 years. And even people's current jobs could really evolve to do more meaningful and more creative and imaginative work where now AI is doing, hey, we'll handle the customer service complaints. We'll take care of the invoicing disputes. We'll take care of the building and returns disputes. Why don't you managers now focus on how to improve processes, how to really understand customer psyche to make sure that we as a company are bringing them what they need or even in your in our world right we've seen your traditional quality assurance analysts that listen to you know calls on end and over end and as ai and speech analytics and nlp plays a role into that now their role gets evolved and they get yeah. elevated learnings to become true analysts of sentiment and now rather than sitting, you know, I've done the QA analyst role, man, it is tough, right? You sit there for a good five hours a day with the headset on till your ears are burning hot and you're just literally listening, 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 and you're grading, you know, how, how the interactions are gone. And with AI, it's that part's gone. So if I had this back in my day when I was doing analyst for QA, I'd be like, great. I can start to actually make recommendations, get a voice heard and really bring myself in the value that I think I can really bring forward to the company rather than, you know, sitting here for five hours a day, just listening to a talk track. Right. And I think and, and that's, yeah, that, 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 that's spot on, man. Right. With what we're doing with beyond QA, right. As humans, as we evolve, we have always did innovation to complement right. The, 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 the status quo, right. S similar to how, you know, this team revolution, happened right it, it was never meant to actually replace anything but it it, it has always been to complement right what has been existing right so i i, I think for ai right now uh, to to what you mentioned daniel we just have to look at the positive side of things and at the same time just also uh be aware of the risk right and how we're gonna be able to play around mitigating it for sure great well jasper this will uh, we'll wrap up our first pilot episode here of C Explorers. I want to thank all our listeners. Um, and again, don't forget to drop a like and subscribe or follow. And um, again, we'll be back twice a month to start off with. Um, and we'll continue the topics on AI, all things tech, and maybe some things cars. <laughs> but again, <laughs> really, really had, the, had a great time with you on this one jasper and kind of talking through some of the topics that we did and for sure we'll, we'll continue the discussion in a few weeks likewise man thank you for all our listeners all right thanks man take care